Good afternoon, everyone. It is an honor to be here with all of you to discuss uh, God's word. This past week, we read and studied uh, from the books of First and Second Peter and Jude. However, our lesson uh, this afternoon will focus on First and Second Peter. And the title, as you can see, is behind me. It is, I am greater than my circumstances. Amen? amen. If you believe that, say amen. amen. If you don't, hopefully, um, after today, you will begin to see why you can say amen. I'd like to start with an opening question. That question is, how confident can we be that some kind of trouble or problem will show up each day of our lives, right? If I were to ask, you know, how many people would say about 90%, 95%, 100%, right? The hands would go up. And I'm talking about the kind of trouble or problems um, that we see, right? Uh, that impact us as well as others. It could be sickness or health to yourself or someone you love, job-related stress, job loss, strain in a relationship, all right? That's not just for married people, but single people. Any, anybody who's alive has relationships with your parents, with your friends, with your coworkers, uh, the people in the community you live in, those things can be impacted. There, th then there are those things, uh, the incidental, uh, episodic occurrences, car malfunction, car accident, and lastly, news about death, right? Those are the realities of things that each day we wake up can potentially visit us. And the reality is that 99.9% .9 of the time, really 100% of the time, right around the corner, something is waiting for you. How comforting. <laughs> you know what, Jesus said that, you know what, in this world you will have trouble or tribulation. But he also said, take heart, I have overcome the world. And there are implications and benefits for you and I. Now, several years later, after Jesus said this, um, Peter would then write the Christians in Asia Minor, <clears throat> who were confused and discouraged by things that were happening to them. And he would say in 1 Peter 4, verses 12 through 13, he says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share in Christ's sufferings, that you may rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Let me ask you another question. Are you surprised by the trials you have today? If I'm honest, sometimes, yes. <laughs> Do you find it strange when you are experiencing your trials? I want you to think about that. Or have you accepted it is a common truth to this life here on earth that you know what? I will have trouble. I will have tribulation. That word, <clears throat> 
Tribulation means internal pressure. We've been talking about it in our mentorship groups. Feeling hemmed in, confined with no options, oppressively afflicted. Have I accepted the reality that I can experience that while I'm here on earth? If you're honest with yourself, if you believe in God's word, you'll say, you know what? Yeah, I can experience that. And when we learn about the realities of our trials, right? They don't make us do a, a happy dance, right? We don't respond the way we, we would when our, our, our team wins, like, yes, let's go! We don't respond that way. You know, we get quiet. <clears throat> Maybe we say, man, is this a dream? Let me, let me wake up, let me, let me see, oh, yes, it's, it's real. <laughs> it's here, it's for real. But what did Peter know <clears throat> about trials that he wanted to impart? That's what I want you to think about. What is it that Peter knew that he wanted to impart to all of us? I believe what that was, was that we, brothers and sisters, are greater than our circumstances. And so when you read Peter, some of the things that are listed and you'll find out is that, you know what? We have divine power. The power that is within us is greater than the troubles of this world. You will find that we have a new identity and a new mind that God has given us. You will find that God's people are prepared and are preparing continuously for action. You'll see that disciples, Christians, live obediently to God no matter what our circumstances are. Amen? Amen? And lastly, you'll find <clears throat> that Peter says that, you know, I, don't want, I want to stir you by way of reminder that we evolve into something better by adding to our faith and experiences through every trial. Amen? Amen. These are the things I believe that Peter wanted us to know. And as we dig into the scriptures, you'll see a little bit more. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 4, it says that his divine power has granted to us all things, all things that pertain to life and godliness through a knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you, brothers and sisters, may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because, <clears throat> because of the sinful desire. So, I want you guys to think about this. His divine power has given us everything, it says, for life and godliness. Therefore, everything you have right now in your life is all that you need. Is all that you need to go through your trial and be successful. Everything that, everything that God has given you from this age, your age, wherever, you know, whatever age you are, um, your marriage that you, that you have, the relationships that you have, your job, you fill in the blanks, whatever it is that God has given you right now, right now in your life, he's equipped you to face the trial. Amen? Amen. You have it, right? You don't have to search for it. You have it to overcome. Now, I want to be clear, this doesn't mean 
You shouldn't continue to seek growth or that there's no additional growth opportunities for you as a person. That's not what I'm saying. You should still pursue that. But what I'm saying is that you have everything that you need and what you will learn is that your trials introduce you to yourself. Did you hear that? Your trials introduce you to yourself. It introduces every man to himself. You learn things about how much faith do I have? How much do I need to grow? What things do I need to grow in? How strong is my mindset? Trials will introduce you to yourself. But remember, you have all that you need. As partakers of this divine nature, it is important that you are fully, fully aware of your superpowers. Did you hear what I said? Be fully aware of your superpowers. When we become aware of our superpowers, we feel like, guess what? I'm ready for whatever comes my way. Whatever comes my way, which brings me to point number two. The power that is within us is greater than the power that is in the world. In 1 John 4, verse 4, it says, Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Amen? Amen. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are more powerful than we think. We are far more capable of doing more for Jesus than we think. We are more resourceful and creative than we give ourselves credit for. But what's the problem? Many of us walk around not recognizing how powerful we are. We say things like, oh, uh, I could never do that. Can God really change my situation? Will I ever overcome that? <clears throat> Let's stop talking like victims because we are victors. Amen. We're winners, amen? amen? Doesn't Ephesians 3 verse 20 say, now to him who is able to do immeasurably, exceedingly, abundantly, more than we could ever ask, think, or imagine? Is God a liar? That is the power that you have access to. The scripture says in James 5.16 that the prayers of the righteous are powerful and effective. They are powerful and effective. So why is it that we are not lifting up everything? Every, every opportunity you should get, you should be like, Lord, lift it up. Lift it up. You know what? We start to recognize that all things are possible with God. Therefore, guess what? All things are possible for who? For who? For us. For me. You should become borderline annoying with this power that you have. Right? You should become borderline annoying, right? Like Superman is looking for the opportunity to jump into the booth. Right? When, when Spider-Man learns of his powers, he's like, choo, 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 yeah. <laughs> right? He's learning what he's able to do. You should become borderline annoying, like walking by, like, did, did I hear you say there was a, a concern? <laughs> Let, let's pray. Right? Let's pray. It should, be you, you, it should be your mantra. You know what? Don't bring concern around me. <laughs> Prayer warrior for real, you know? <laughs> ask, ask somebody. Right? Prayer warrior for real. 
that should be us. Why? Because we have access to power that the world does not have. We have access to power that the world does not have. Therefore, let us stop telling God how big our problems are and start telling our problems how big our God is. Right? You know, and you know what? You might feel a little crazy at first when you do this, but I encourage you to practice this. Do, do this at home. You know, say what, Lord, you know what I have? There's this stress that keeps, you know, at work that keeps, you know, hounding me, but you know, he's, he's no match for you. Fear is no match for my God. So why am I, why am I afraid? Why should I be afraid? God is bigger than my problems. <clears throat> Try this at home. Practice at home these things, and you'll begin to say, you know what? I am greater than my circumstances. I am greater than all my problems, right? Like Rocky Balboa, you won't be like, hey. no, I'm not gonna say Adrian. You'll be like, amen! <laughs> Life's problems and trials, Oh man, you know what? Something is wrong with my health. My God is bigger. My financial situation, oh man, I'm broke. No, you're not broke, you're blessed. <laughs> so I'm saying, oh man, that, that relationship, you know what? There's hope. So long as there's breath in the person's lungs, so long as there's breath in your lungs, there is hope. Your traumatic experiences, Right? Maybe you were neglected by your father or mother as a child. Maybe you were abused. Guess what? God is greater than your circumstance. You have a father who says, never will I forsake you. Never will I leave you. I'm right here. <clears throat> okay, you've experienced some, some past failures. Now you walk around saying, oh, I'm a loser. I'm no good. Nope. You're blessed. You've experienced job loss? I've experienced it. In fact, a few times, a few times in uh, 2017, <clears throat> you know, after working about 16 years um, up to that point, that was the first time I experienced it and then experienced it again. And it was such a humbling experience as a man. You know, I'm thinking about, man, you know, is my wife gonna still respect me? I'm thinking about my boys and, you know, them see, you know, seeing me experience this. And I realized that, you know what, Lord, this is, this is good. This is good because you know what, one day they're gonna experience failure. They're gonna experience some kind of hurt. And it was important for me to go through, you know, what I went through so that when they go through something difficult, they remember the power that they have. When they're going through something difficult, they push forward. They keep fighting with prayer. They keep fighting with being open, you know, making themselves vulnerable to the people of God, saying, help me. <clears throat> Because you know what? The reality is that nobody is exempt. <laughs> I have my trial and you have yours. <clears throat> In Proverbs 24, verse 16, it says that, for though the righteous fall seven times, they rise again. Amen. Psalm 37, verse 23 through four, it says, the Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Though he may stumble, he will not fall. For the Lord upholds him by his hand. So how do I live greater than my circumstances? It is important, yes, to know the power that I have, but also to know my identity. Know my identity and make sure that my mind aligns to my identity. 
All right. In First Peter chapter two, verses nine, many of us know the scripture. It says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God wants you to know your identity. And so I want to ask you, do you think like royalty? Or do you think like a peasant? Which one? Do you think like, wow, you know what? I serve this great and powerful God who has great things in store for me. Or do I think, oh, no, you know, not, 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 not for me. It's not for me. When you attend a fellowship at a brother or a sister's home, do you expect to eat out of a trash can? Do you expect to be like, oh man, look what we got for you. Oh, you know, come on. Open this up. I'm sorry for those on, on video. Let me stay here, <laughs> moving all over the place. But you don't expect to eat out of trash cans. So why would you <clears throat> think that God isn't doing a beautifying work in your life through your trial. Why do you think that God would just, you know, want to give you something disgusting when he's creating something beautiful? Something beautiful. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 through 7, it says, in all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer all kinds of trials. These have come so that you, brothers and sisters, the proven genuineness of your faith, which is of greater worth than gold, which perishes, gold perishes, which is refined by fire, but your faith won't perish. It says it may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. We learn that about ourselves, and we'll also see that on the last day. God is doing something amazing. I know our brother Steve gave us a great lesson around this one verse in 1 Peter chapter uh, 1, verses 3 through 5, about what God has in store for us, that we are born again to a living hope. We have an inheritance that is imperishable, it's undefiled, it's unfading, it's kept in heaven for you. It's kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed on the last day. And so for the Christian, when we're going through the trial, when we're going through the fire, when we're going through the storm, there's two outcomes. We win or we learn. We don't lose. Amen? Amen. We win. Or we learn. I believe it's in Isaiah. It speaks about, look, when you're going through the fire, your feet will not be what? They won't be burned. When you're going through the, the flood waters, it will not overwhelm you. And so when you're going through the trial, it's important that we set our hope, our eyes fully fixed, on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of faith. Because God will bring you through. And so in order to bring us through, it's important that we do something. That, th that something is preparing your mind, my mind, for action. Prepare your mind for action. First Peter chapter 1, verse 13, it says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, 
set your hope where? Fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Set your hope there. Set it there. Keep it there. It is believed that a human being can have approximately 60 to 80,000 thoughts per day. That's a lot of thoughts. And you can test it. Sometimes you're thinking about like, man, why am I sitting here? Or, you know, what, you know, <laughs> what am I going to cook when I go home? You know, why did that guy cut me off? Oh, yeah, what do I have to do for work tomorrow? Oh, yeah, I got to talk to that brother. I got to talk to that sister. If you stop and think, you have a lot of thoughts running through your mind. But guess what? God knew that about us, which is why he tells us, you know what? Prepare for action. And so how do we, how do we prepare for action? Um, part of preparing for action is to doing what God says here in this verse. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, guess what? What should you do? Think, 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 think about such things. Put your mind on excellent things, praiseworthy things. And we do that with the use of our, our, our mouth. We do that changing our, our, our paradigm, thinking about such things. High achievers do this. We know high achievers do this in sport, right? There's a simulation where athletes you know, they, they think about the most difficult situation and how they're going to respond or they're going to react. People practice their, 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 their presentations. Uh, <clears throat> so many things. People practice this for business. They practice this for social issues. Several years ago during the civil rights movement, some groups would stage these negative experiences. Right? They would go to restaurants and have people insult them, spit at them, pour things on them. And what would they do? <clears throat> they would stand there with the determination to be peaceful. What were they doing? They were preparing their minds for action. What about you? Do you think about how you're going to respond if your spouse reacts a certain way? How are you going to respond when you go to work and your boss acts a certain way? Remember, God is, God is doing something great, but your adversary roams around. <laughs> waiting, waiting to devour you. And it's usually in those most vulnerable moments in our life that we're receptive to maybe doing something that, you know, in our right mind, we wouldn't do. In your right mind, you'd be like, you know, what's going on, you know, away from me. But when you're vulnerable, when, when the pain is real, when the pain remains and it doesn't go away right away, <clears throat> you are sometimes susceptible to doing things that are outside of your mind. And so somebody may come and ask you, hey, are you okay? We might be thinking it, but we won't say, are you losing your mind? <laughs> I just want to check in. <clears throat> so it's important that we, we put our mind in, in the right place. We say the right things to ourselves. I hope you have conversations with yourself. You know, I, I know there used to be a, a, a song, I talk to myself, because there's no one to, to talk to. But, you know, we actually have people to talk to. You know, but I talk to myself to tell myself the right things, right? Because the Bible says here in Proverbs 18, verse 21, that 
The tongue has the power of life and death, and those that love it will eat of its fruit. What does that mean? Your words, when you're going through your trial, have the ability to shape the outcome of your life. You hear what I'm saying? Your words have the ability to shape what it's going to look like. And so it's very important that you say the right things to go through the storm. Right? So you don't say, oh, I'm just, I'm a sick person. You know, this is my life. No, no. I am of a chosen race. This is just my circumstance. This is not who I am. Oh, you know, my, 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 my finances, you know, you don't understand, you know, oh, I'm a failure. No, no. I am of God's own possession. Do you tell yourself these things? In those moments where you feel like nothing, right? I think our brother Rob shared some weeks ago and he had us say from up here, I am fearfully and what? Wonderfully made that we are. So don't ever take for granted your uniqueness because every individual in this room has something to offer. And I thank God that we're not all the same. Wouldn't it be boring if we all had the same struggles? What would we pray for? <laughs> be like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, I know. Right? And so I appreciated Pedro's lesson when he was highlighting that, that God has made us all so unique, all so diverse with different trials. Because I must say that um, whether you're aware of it or not, <clears throat> that many of your trials have actually blessed me. And I know it's blessed other people as well. When I see some of the things that some of our members here have gone through with their health, and they're still here. Some of the things that you guys have gone through with your children, and you're still here. Some of the things that you guys have gone through in your marriages, yet you haven't given up on them. Some of those things that have caused us so much pain, but also made us so beautiful. I say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for running the race, brother. Thank you, sister, for enduring your trial, helping me to not want to throw in the towel when I was going through my trial. Helping me to say, you know what, I, I, can, I can go another day. I can keep fighting. I can keep pushing forward. And though my pain is real, guess what? I and you are greater than what? My circumstances. And it's important that we know that because when we're going through the painful circumstance. We don't feel like sometimes doing what's right. Are you guys honest? Do you always feel like being like, yeah? We don't always feel like doing what's right. But one of the things that makes us greater than our circumstance is that, you know what, no matter what it is that we are going through, we continue to live obediently to the Lord Jesus Christ. First Peter 2, verse 11 through 12, it says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct, how? Among the Gentiles, honorable. So that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and do what? Glorify God on the day of his visitation. It is all worth it. You may not have the reward right now, but it is all worth it to keep pushing, to keep doing what is right, to keep loving in a, in a difficult marriage, to keep bearing with your children, to keep 
bearing with a difficult boss, a difficult parent, a difficult child. Keep living in an honorable way. Because God is looking and he's like, oh yeah, you know what, that, my child, I, I knew he could go through that. Go read Job and see that God was like, oh yeah, you know what, he, he's gonna come out shining. And if you look, God never ever explained to him, to Job, why he went through what he went through. <laughs> he never did. And so one of the things that we learn is that we can stop saying, oh, why me? And start saying, Lord, what, what for? What purpose is this for? How, you know, how am I going to become better through this? How am I going to bless someone through my affliction? How can I be that impactful person that you want me to be? It doesn't feel good right now. I don't want it right now. But I know that you're beautifying me. I know that that sister over there, man, she's, you got to make her look so amazing. That brother, what he's going through, when he comes through, oh man, shining like stars, shining like gold that you are. So it's important to know <clears throat> that when you're going through it, that you live obediently. You live obediently, right? In some of the verses directly after this, it says, be subject to human institutions in verse 13. How are we doing with that? It also says, living as people that are free, you know, not as a cover up for evil in 1 Peter 2 verse 16. It also says, fear God, honor the emperor. We don't have an emperor but we have a mayor, a governor, we have a senator, we have a president, we have an attorney general. We have all these people that we should be hopefully praying for. Are you using your power? Are you using your superpower for your good, for the good of our society, for the good of the brethren to glorify God. I hope you are because one of the things as you guys go through your experiences, you go through your trials, you're not the same person. Are you the same person? I want you to think about that. Are you the same person you were before the last trial visited you? As I told you, some of you have encouraged me by how you've beat your fight against cancer, <clears throat> how you've um, you know, kept a positive attitude with some of the things that are going on, some of, the, some of the, the, the pains with some of the things that you guys have had to deal with with your family members. It hurts, it hurts, but you guys have endured, you've endured and one of the things that Peter highlights here that we are greater than our circumstance is because we keep evolving. We're not the same. We're not the same person that we were prior to our trial. I can tell you I'm not the same person that I was. I used to have the mindset of like, oh, it's a vic I'm a victim or and that person did that and that. And I'm like, no, Lord, you... You wanted to teach me some things that I needed to grow in. You wanted to refine me. You wanted to make me better. You wanted to help me so that when somebody else is going through, through it, I can put my arm around them and say, it's going to be OK. And when you've gone through something that I haven't gone through, you can say, hey, Vic, it's going to be OK. And you guys can comfort somebody else and say, hey, you know what, it's going to be okay because God is with us <clears throat> and so in second Peter chapter 1 verse 5 where he says 
You know what? Yes, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness earlier. Now, later in the verse, he says, for this very reason, make every effort, effort to supplement to your faith with virtue. With virtue, he says, you know what? Add knowledge with knowledge, self-control, then add steadfastness, then add godliness. After godliness, he says, brotherly affection, and with brotherly affection, love. He says, for if you have these things or these qualities are yours in increasing measure, you will be, or they will keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to think about this. And then I want you to think about who's writing this. Right? This is coming from Peter, a man who cut someone's ear off when they were coming to arrest our Lord. It's like, stand back! Now the same man is saying, be self-controlled. Did Peter evolve? The same Peter who said, oh, no, I'll never deny you, Lord. Never, 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 never. The Lord says, you know what, behind me, Satan, you know, before this rooster crows three times. Guess what happened to Peter? Did he fail? For a little bit. When trouble came, right, because that's what was happening to Peter, he was experiencing trouble. They were saying, wait, weren't you the man that was with Jesus? He's like, I, I don't know the man. Then someone else comes and like, wait, weren't you one of his disciples? Oh yeah, I think I saw you with him. He's like, I told you, I don't know the man. Then he starts to swear and bring down curses on himself. But then the same Peter who denied Jesus, if you read Acts, after being thrown in prison and charged and warned not to preach the gospel, comes out, was freed by an angel, and then they're saying, Did, didn't I tell you not to speak? And the same Peter says, what? Is it better to obey who? God or man? Did Peter evolve? Peter evolved. The same Peter who had issues with some of the uncircumcised brothers that Paul had to rebuke him is now encouraging you to practice brotherly affection. Did Peter, did he evolve? And so if Peter evolved, the question becomes, what about you and I? You, are, you and I, are we the same person? Or do we too change to be more and more like Jesus? Hopefully we change. And when we go through our trial, we see that, you know what, I'm not the same person. I'm not the same person. I am something different. I'm a better version of myself. Some of you guys remember Kung Fu Panda? Poe? Like, like, you know, all around the place. And, but what happens? He recognizes that. Oh. <laughs> we're like, wow, don't mess, don't mess with Poe. <laughs> Ding! You know, like this little. Same thing, if we, we, we look at some of what God has created in, 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 in nature, <clears throat> this caterpillar goes through some painful things. Doesn't look very attractive at first, but then it becomes this beautiful, beautiful butterfly. It goes through an amazing transformation. And so, I ask you one of my closing questions. Has the knowledge of Christ made you more fruitful and effective? Have your experiences 
made you more fruitful and, and, and effective by adding to all those things that were spoken about in the scripture. Because that's what should be happening for all of us. We should be evolving and transforming into the amazing and beautiful person that God made you to be. If you haven't heard it, let me tell you, you're amazing. And the reason why I'm confident I can say that is because my God is amazing, right? Our God is awesome, right? We sing that, he's awesome. And the person that made you, made you beautiful and awesome. And so if you are sitting here today, brother and sister, I want you to know that I pray that he who began a good work in you will continue it until the day of completion because God is doing the work. And if you are visiting with us, I want you to also know that the power that was spoken about today is available to you through obedience to the gospel, which is surrendering and obeying the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ through the waters of baptism. I pray, again, if you're visiting with us, that you would actually stick around or ask the person who invited you out to learn more about personal Bible studies and to access this power because the power is available to you. God loves you so very much. He cares about you so very much. And he wants us to know that, you know what? I am greater. Can we say that? I am greater. Than my circumstance. my circumstance. You are. So hold your head up high. <clears throat> Be confident. Because the spirit that God gives is not one of timidity, but one of what? Oh man, that one of what? Power. Power. God has given us power to live amazing lives and to let people know that there is hope. In, a, in the midst of so much chaos and craziness going on. And it's a, it's a crazy time right now in our society, but there is hope. Not only for us, there is hope for you <clears throat> that God, if you give him an opportunity, will do something amazing in your life. And so I hope that these things will press upon your mind as we close out that you will remember them throughout the week, that you will be devoted to those things listed so that you can live a life greater than your circumstance. Amen? Amen. Good afternoon. How's everybody doing today? Hope you're enjoying this beautiful fall weather. Certainly a perfect day today. We're at the part of our service where we remember what Jesus did for us on the cross how he was willing to come down from heaven, suffer immensely, die on a cross, and rose on the third day, giving us a new hope and a new life in Christ. It's also a time where we should clear our minds and reflect on our own lives as we take the bread and the fruit of the vine to ensure that we are taking it in a worthy manner and not in vain. Today's lesson topic is inheritance, and it's about our inheritance that's kept in heaven by God. So what is an inheritance? Let's look at it from, from a worldly standpoint first. So it can be defined as a process which involves the passing on of material property from one generation to another, usually within the family, and generally from older parents to their adult children, which is completed after death of the older generation. In other words, it's material wealth, whether it's money, a house or an estate that's passed on from parents to their children. There are many uh, worldly examples that we can look at of generational wealth, um, but let's talk about someone uh, that has been in the news lately. So many of you know or may not know who this person is, um, but Elon Musk is the founder of Tesla and SpaceX, just to name a few of his companies, and is considered to be the modern day Einstein of our era 
or the modern day Edison or the modern day Nikola Tesla, just pick one, because he's quite a brilliant man and has done some really great things from a worldly perspective. Well, earlier this week, uh, Tesla struck a deal with Hertz, the rental car company, where Hertz pledged to buy 100,000 Teslas for their rental fleet over the next few years. When that announcement hit the news, Tesla's stock soared. And with that announcement alone, Elon Musk's net worth rose by an estimated $28 billion in a single day without having to sell one car. So when you think about the inheritance that his seven children will be receiving upon his death, it's actually quite mind blowing and mind boggling. But as you think about uh, this inheritance that, that his children are gonna receive, I would like to, for you to consider just a few things. For one, what is the true value of this inheritance? Does this inheritance have any eternal value whatsoever? Everyone in this world, whether you're a Christian or not, knows for the most part that you can't take money to your grave. Some may try, but in the end, the money would eventually perish and, and turn to ashes. So what is the value of this inheritance? Let's assume for a second that Elon lives to 85, about 85 years old, and that puts his youngest child of seven at around 36 when Elon dies. And assuming he lives, that child lives to be 85, he would get about 40 to 50 years living off of that inheritance. But after that child dies, that same inheritance turns back to zero and is worthless because now that child has passed away. So now, you know, what if I told you, based on that information, but what if I told you that we, as Christians, have an eternal inheritance that is worth way more than billions and billions and billions of dollars? Just keep adding zeros to that, to that number. It's an inheritance that never perishes, spoils, or fades. An inheritance that is being held for you, specifically for you, in heaven, and was created by the creator of all things, including the creator of Elon Musk. An inheritance that you can actually take to the grave with you, because when we die, we actually live. This is the inheritance that was made available to us with Jesus Christ when he died on the cross, when he was buried, and most importantly, when he rose from the dead. First Peter 1, three through five, it reads, praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God has given us a new birth because of his great mercy. We have been born into a new life that has a confidence which is alive because Jesus Christ has come back to life. We have been born into a new life which has an inheritance that can't be destroyed or corrupted and can't fade away. Another version says it can never perish, spoil, or fade. That inheritance is kept in heaven for you, since you are guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed at the end of time. So this inheritance that is available to us, it's available to us because Jesus conquered death on the cross and rose from the grave. And to that we can say amen. amen. And this is why we commemorate him every Sunday. And as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper, I want to leave you with this comparison of our inheritance and any other worldly inheritance that you can think of. And let us meditate and be ever so thankful for what Jesus has done for us on the cross and what he provides to us through his resurrection. Amen. amen. It is in giving that we receive. It is in parting that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Make me an instrument of your peace. I want to know what it's like to follow you when men look at me i want them to see the light of the world inside it is in giving that we receive and it is in pardoning that we are pardoned 
and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. So make me an instrument of your peace. I want to know what it's like to follow you. When men look at me, I want them to see the light of the world inside. When men look at me, I want them to see the light of the world inside. That's the goal of every Christian that Jesus shines through. Amen.